Thank you very much, Masoka. It's, um, it's very inspiring the way that you've outlined, in fact, a number of the um, unexpected positive benefits, actually, in terms of uh, built-up capacity. I'll, I'll follow up with you um, after on that. But I would like to um, next ask uh, Dr. Gabriel Lung to share with us his experience <coughs> uh, in Hong Kong. He's the Dean of Medicine of the University of Hong Kong, a medical doctor, also a scientist, also a former alumni of the panel that I mentioned uh, earlier, and among many leadership roles he's held um, was leading Hong Kong's response to the H1N1 uh, outbreak in 2009. But he's going to be speaking to us today about SARS. Gabriel, over to you. Right. Thanks very much, uh, Suri. And as I was preparing this um, for this panel, I looked at the topic that was posed, and the topic says the tr critical difference of whether strong national capacities are in place and trying to bring to bear a comparative approach with SARS, MERS, and of course the Ebola epidemic. So I suppose my role and, uh, is, is really to reflect on Hong Kong's experience with SARS. Um, so did Hong Kong have good capacity in place for SARS? Well, I'm afraid the short and brutal answer was a resounding no uh, in 2003. Now, this was one of the tourism ads uh, Hong Kong placed all over the world uh, just prior, literally weeks prior to SARS becoming public. <laughs> Hong Kong will take your breath away. Uh, this was actually taken from a, uh, an ad placed in a magazine in the UK. Now, of course, Hong Kong promptly withdrew that ad, but it's, it's true, actually, almost prophetically, that Hong Kong was not at all ready in terms of our capacity to deal with SARS. Notwithstanding, of course, um, our sentinel experience with the 97 H5 uh, human cluster of 18, six of whom died. Nevertheless, Hong Kong, for SARS, was in the same company as the other SARS-affected areas, including mainland China, Taiwan, Singapore, and Canada, all of which lost our health ministers and the top echelon of health officials, as well as, as you can see, established post hoc, or at least strengthened national health agencies. Now, there were two new agencies formed as a direct result of SARS. One was the Center for Health Protection in Hong Kong, uh, and the second one was the Public Health Agency of Canada uh, in that country. Um, the mainland Chinese CDC and the Taiwanese CDC predated uh, SARS, but had a complete transformation uh, as a result of SARS. And of course, I, for good measure, I added in the European CDC, which is having troubles of its own, especially of uh, recently. And of course, the new um, initiative in Africa, uh, in terms of the African CDC out of Addis. Now, post-SARS, in addition to beefing up local preparedness in terms of the new agency called Center for Health Protection, a regional, and by that I mean the Pearl River Delta region, which is now renamed as the Greater Bay Area, and national level liaison with the rest of China, uh, communication and coordination with three specific regulatory sectors, health, food, and commerce uh, underwent a series of marked step changes. For example, uh, supply chain management uh, in terms of registered farms, pre-import testing, and quota controls for farm animals like poultry, like pigs, uh, both of which, of course, have integral parts to do with the transmission cycle of flu. Now, second thing that we did was Post-SARS, we beefed up even more local farm, wholesale, and retail market interventions and monitored it using the tracer flu virus H9N2. You can see from this diagram, basically from the 97 outbreak when KG led the CDC team uh, to Hong Kong, um, what we've done was progressively introduced wet market measures. Number one, we introduced one whole rest day where we basically washed down all retail markets. We found that it didn't really quite work, so we said, all right, we'll do it every fortnight instead of every month. That reduced it, yeah, to 
acceptable levels, except that we had some major outbreaks. And so we said, basically, no poultry, no live poultry overnight. And then you see, basically, it approximates zero. Um, of course, we've also done proactive health communication vis-a-vis -vis messaging and population cycle behavioral surveillance and engagement. We've also got a remarkable uh, universal policy of screening all febrile respiratory admissions uh, in all public hospitals, which accounts for 90 plus percent of all admissions in Hong Kong. And now, despite that, this is the typical uh, winter surge that we see even to this day. So can you imagine if we don't actually do uh, quick uh, bedside tests, uh, what might happen? Um, also, we've got a remarkable density of POSARs, uh, BSL-3 labs. Uh, we've got actually five of these facilities in Hong Kong, given our space. I think we've probably got the densest um, uh, uh, agglomeration of these BSL-3 facilities. We've got two H5 reference labs and, of course, a WHO collaborating center. Now, of course, all that was in preparation for two other tests since 2003. Number one is, of course, 2009, a pandemic H1. Um, so May 1st, this is what happened to a hotel. This slide, uh, or a corresponding version of it, was shown to you by Laurie Garrett yesterday, um, where we quarantined an entire hotel for a whole week in Hong Kong and closed schools early, which allowed us to delay local transmission by exactly 40 days. Quarantino and where the word quarantines comes from. Uh, we've got daily uh, press briefings. Um, and we have also, of course, uh, done evaluation studies of whether school closure works. Uh, the middle panel, which is the only time in the last 10 years that it has worked, we've closed schools uh, early for three times, but actually it was only during the pandemic that it actually worked by reducing transmission up to one quarter. Um, we tested out the proactive engagement strategy in terms of the communication. Um, and we also, um, let me just go back. And then we also did the vaccination thing. But like what Tony Fauci showed you yesterday, it was too little, too late. Uh, I was in government at that time. I went to, to the legislature and asked for money and ended up throwing away 95% of what we bought, um, like most of the world. Then we were tested again uh, for, whoops. We were tested again in 2013, but this time H7 and 9 never came to Hong Kong. It was in the other big river delta in China, uh, the, the Yangtze River Delta in and around Shanghai, but Hong Kong co contributed. Now this time, in terms of our local capacity, we contributed to the national effort, where at the top, we will help the Zhejiang group under Li Lanjuan uh, to report on the first series of clinical cases. Uh, and then Malak Perez and colleagues um, worked with the Shanghainese group to look at the pathogenesis of H7. And then my team worked with the national CDC on characterizing the epidemiology of H7, as well as looked at uh, whether closing wet markets might help. So beyond flu and SARS, um, you can see in the middle there, KG Fukuda. And at the back, uh, on your left, you can see Malik Perez. And hidden behind uh, the first row is David Ho. And these people all contributed to the Korean, South Korean investigation uh, led by the WHO for the Seoul MERS outbreak. Um, further, we, the last time I was in this building was working with CC and Ayano um, and Mosoka uh, on the various um, post-Ebola review panels. Uh, and so you can see that basically Hong Kong has come a very, very long way from the time of SARS, where we had very little capacity uh, in Hong Kong to deal with something that is like SARS or pandemic flu. But then over the ensuing 15 years, we could, and if we could, anybody could, actually build that kind of capacity. And I hope that this uh, would lead to more of these growth and development of pandemic preparedness. Thank you.